So welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Kirsty Meddings. I'm a product manager here at Crossthrift. And <coughs> today I'm going to walk through how our members need to go about um, getting set up with our Crossmark service. Um, I've got, it's quite a short session. I've got about 15 minutes worth of slides um, that I'll just run through and I'll keep, we'll keep everybody on mute just while I do that to avoid background noise. Um, but it's plenty of time at the end for questions. So you can either type them into the Zoom uh, chat box or Q&A as you go along, or at the end I can unmute people and you can ask questions. Okay, first of all, just to cover what Crossmark service is, <coughs> Crossmark's made up of two elements. Um, it's a button uh, that sits next to your content on your websites and a set of accompanying metadata that together can tell readers about the publication status of the piece of content, so whether there have been any updates to that piece of content, such as uh, corrections or retractions. But it can also give them lots of other information, um, such as funding information, authors or kids, uh, publication history, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and I'll go into a little bit more detail of all of these as we go through today. So hopefully um, you've got a, a, a passing understanding of what Crossmark is, but I'm just going to show you some examples to show you how it works. So this is a PDF of an article and up in the top left hand corner here you can see that there is a crossmark button and when you click on that um, a browser window pops up and it gives the latest status of that piece of content and this is what most people see most of the time just confirmation that there have been no changes to this document and that it's up to date um, but a reminder that if there are any updates this is the place to come to see it. It also contains the DOI link that points back to the publisher's, um, publisher's copy on their website and a link out to the publisher's policies on things like corrections and retractions. So no updates for this particular um, piece of content. Let's take another example. This time it's a web page, an article on a web page and the crossmark button check for updates is at the top right. And here, clicking on the button brings up the same box, um, but here there's a bit of a warning that something has happened to this content, that an update has been issued. So there is a correction, uh, labelled as a corrigendum here, um, and the date that that was made available, and there's a link through to go straight to the correction notice so that the reader can see how this piece of content has been changed. And the colour changes to emphasise that something they need to pay attention to, but I can click on that link below the correction um, and get taken to the correction notice, which I don't have a slide off, I apologise. <clears throat> this is a third example, again, on an article on a web page, clicking on the crossmark button. And this time we see that this article has actually been retracted. Um, so a red warning um, and again, a link there that will take the reader straight through to the retraction notice. So this is how Crossmark is used to alert readers to important updates to published content. So just to put some definition around what we mean when we talk about an update to a piece of content, <clears throat> in order to trigger a Crossmark status update, changes to the content have to be um, significant changes um, and significant enough that they either affect the crediting or the interpretation of the work. Um, within the arena of scholarly publishing, there's a limited set of events that meet this criteria. Um, and we've worked with our publishers, our members, um, to define a list of these events. So these are the 12 status update types that can be used in Crossmark. They are actually pretty broad and cover um, most situations, obviously correction, corrigendum, errata, and often used interchangeably. Anything that's not on this list that could be considered a minor update, such as publishing a version of record when you've already got an accepted manuscript up, um, as long as the changes between the versions are largely cosmetic, correcting typos, um, changing the layout, that should not trigger any kind of crossmark update. But if a change comes along that requires the issue of a correction um, or expression of concern, that's um, that's considered serious enough to trigger an alert to the reader that they should pay attention to that change. There is room for you to put information about minor changes um, in the Crossmark box, and I'll show you an example of that um, in a moment. <clears throat> but in terms of saying this piece of content has been updated and I want the Crossmark box to reflect that, it has to be one of these 12 um, <coughs> 
um, types of update uh, that you submit to us in your metadata. So now I'm going to walk through the steps that you need to take to actually um, get set up with this. Anyone who's a member of Crossref can uh, get set up and participate in Crossmark. We ask that you um, deposit good quality and comprehensive metadata so that the Crossmark box is well populated. But you can start out with an absolute minimum, which is on my next slide. You need to commit to displaying the Crossmark button next to the article title on your web pages and in your PDFs. And of course, critically, you need to commit to um, letting Crossref know whenever a piece of content changes. And you do this through these practical steps. The first thing that we ask you to do is to create what we call a Crossmark policy page on your website. And at its simplest, this just explains um, that you're participating in the Crossmark service in order to make sure updates are um, made very available and readers are made aware of them. But it can also link out to your own policies on corrections and retractions. Perhaps it's your guidelines for authors page. You probably have a page um, that exists like this already. Once you've identified or created this page, you need to sign it its own DOI so that it can be linked to persistently and then deposit that page uh, with Crossref. Um, <clears throat> and there are instructions for how to do that. If you follow the URLs on these slides, the detail of how exactly you deposit a policy page is all in our support documentation. And then you need to deposit Crossmark metadata for each of the DOIs that you want to display the Crossmark button on. Now at the absolute minimum, that's the DOI of the content that you're adding the button to, the DOI that contains the link to the Crossmark policy page, and if the content that you're depositing is either a correction notice or a retraction notice or something like that, it also needs to have the DOI of the content that it's updating. So the way that the updates work is if you issue Article A in 2017 and then a correction notice is published in 2018, in 2018 you send us the metadata for the correction notice with its DOI and then also reference the DOI of the article that you published the year previously. You also need to go into um, the HTML headers of your website and make sure that the DOI for each article is hidden away in the HTML metadata. That's because when the reader clicks on the button on the page, the widget behind the button searches through your HTML of your website to find out which DOI it needs to retrieve um, information for. So this is all done live when the user clicks on the button, <clears throat> the button comes and talks to the Crossref database to find out whether there have been any updates and it needs to come to us saying I want to know about updates for this DOI. And then you need to put the button on your website and in your PDFs. Um, to do this, it's very simple. There's a snippet of code that we've written that you just add in um, to your web pages that will both display the button and call the pop-up box. We do ask that it's fairly prominent next to the article metadata rather than hidden away in other menus or, or at the bottom. We've got a range of different types and sizes of button that you can use, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, if you are going to go through and add Crossmark to uh, older content after you've done your current content, um, it's okay to just add it to your web pages. The current content going forward, we do ask that you make sure the Crossmark button is in your PDFs and on your websites, but we understand that if you want to go back through that file, um, it's not ideal to be asked to regenerate PDFs. This is the snippet of code that I mentioned that you need to add into your web pages. It's available again from our website. It's as simple as that. Um, and that sits on your web pages, called, places the Crossmark button and calls the Crossref database to bring the Crossmark box. And as I mentioned, there are different shapes and sizes of the Crossmark button to suit your, the style of your website or the layout of your website. And then to make really the best use of Crossmark and make sure that that Crossmark pop-up box that readers see is, is as useful as it can be um, to the readers, 
uh, we ask that you try to deposit as much additional metadata as you can. So if you deposit funding data to Crossref, that's, so that's the names of funders from the acknowledgement sections, we will pull that out of your metadata and automatically place it in a Crossmark box. The same is true of license information. If you're sending us um, URLs that point to licenses that are applicable to your content, we'll pull that through into the Crossmark box. And ORCIDs, if you're submitting or ORCID IDs uh, for your authors, Again, we'll pull that information through and display an ORCID link next to the author in the Crossmark box. So there's quite a long list of things that you can do that make the Crossmark box, when it appears, a really rich resource for the reader. So to show you how that looks, as I mentioned, authors are automatically pulled out of the metadata. Um, and where's my slide not moving on? Let's just take a moment to catch up. So we display the authors. We will display. My apologies, my slides have frozen. Let me just jump out and go back in again. Sorry, everybody. There's always something that glitches. Just move on manually. Okay, <laughs> carrying on. Um, as I said, if you're depositing funding data, We'll look in your metadata and pull that out and display that in the Crossmark box here. Oh, it's doing it again. It's turning into a very manual, manual presentation. I think I see what I've done wrong. My mistake. Um, and finally, there's a section in the Crossmark box which is called More Information. And this is pretty much just freehand for whatever you want to add in. So you can leave it completely blank if you want, or you can put in any additional information that you think the reader might be interested in. <clears throat> How the layout and the content and the links are entirely defined by you. Um, again, details about how to do that on our support site. This is a really good example. This particular publisher has decided to uh, expose the peer review process and what whether the piece has been peer reviewed and to give a list of publication history there. So when it was received, accepted and published online. They've also put a link out to supplementary materials. So <clears throat> by adding all this into the more information section, um, there's really an awful lot of context um, for the reader. There is a charge for the Crossmark service on top of the normal deposit fees for current content is 20 cents per DOI and back file is two cents per DOI. And we define current content as everything published in the last two full years and the year to date. So just to wrap up, I'll give you some uh, numbers. So far we have, this was a couple of weeks ago, so it'll be a little bit more now, nearly 7 million um, DOIs that have got Crossmarks and Crossmark metadata deposits. That's 600 of our members that are participating in Crossmark. And of those nearly 7 million um, Crossmark DOIs, 81,000 of them have some kind of state status update. Just over 2,000 are records of retractions in our database and 66,000 uh, corrections have been recorded so far. And again, just about half of those 6.8 million cross-marked DOIs have got some kind of additional metadata in that more information box. So about half of um, the members are making use of that to display other, other information to the readers. Which brings me quite neatly, and I've had 15 minutes, as I promised, um, to the end of my slides. Tons of information on our website at this URL, and that's my email address for um, any additional questions. Um, but now I will come out of uh, my full screen and ask if there are any questions. Maybe I can do that.
I'm just going to pause sharing for a second so I can move my toolbar around. That's better. So as I say, please feel free to either, there's a Q&A section in the Zoom tool here, and there's also a chat session. And if you have any questions, you're very welcome to type them into either of those boxes and I will do my best to answer them. I'm just looking to see if there's a way for people to raise their hand if they'd like me to unmute them to talk. So I'm also happy to do that. Okay. I don't think anyone's typing. I would like to give it a few minutes just in case I cut anyone off when they are. But please do feel free to contact me if you think of anything after the session today. We will be circulating the slides. And I think um, my colleague has recorded the session, so we'll be sending around a link uh, to the video, complete with its mistakes in the middle there when my slides didn't work. Um, but otherwise, I'll just say thank you very much for your time today um, and enjoy the rest of your day.